Welcome, everyone. I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, self-time neuromorphic circuits. So something you may have noticed in some of the earlier talks is a lot of mention of the notion of event-driven. I mean, I think that everybody's mentioned that word. And um, the question is, how do you really make that a reality? So um, one of the things we, we work on, my, so my group has been designing asynchronous circuits, or some, also known as self-time circuits, for a, a long time now. Um, along with a s small community of researchers around the world. And uh, that's actually something that almost every neuromorphic system uses today. Right? Uh, the, the brain scares projects, the facets project, the, the work at UCSD with IFAT, the work at Stanford with Neurogrid, and, and True North as well uses asynchronous circuits. And I'd like to sort of begin by taking a little bit of a step back to try to explain why that is the case. So, if I look at computing, right, if most of us, I would assume if I look at this audience as a, the people from lots of different disciplinary areas, most, of, most people aren't designing circuits on a daily basis, right? I mean, I, like, I do that for a living, but most people aren't doing that. Instead, when you think about a computation, you're thinking about algorithms, right? No matter what you sort of did, if you're doing something computing related, you, you took something related to algorithms before. And when, when you looked at algorithms, you looked at things like complexity, right, like, like big O notation, What's the computational complexity of an algorithm, right? And you can measure this complexity in a number of ways, but the bottom line is when you write a computer program, for example, you have some view that the program you wrote is going to be efficient or run efficiently on the hardware you have, which may be your you know, laptop computer or desktop computer. And the reason we have this notion and the reason this notion is valuable is that my abstract notion of the cost for doing sort of my, running my algorithm, which corresponds, say, you know, I'm going to do an addition that's going to take, say, one unit of work. I'm going to access memory. That's a single operation. I have some sort of mental model for what's going on. When that computation finally gets mapped to the physical implementation of the computation, those two notions of cost correspond. Right? That's sort of fundamentally why this is a good idea. I mean, if those, if those notions don't correspond, you know, what you think is a good algorithm is going to turn out to be a really bad algorithm in practice. And in fact, you know, with, you know, f sophisticated microprocessors today, with things like fancy memory hierarchies, you see this already, right? Sometimes a simple algorithm that you think is very efficient when you actually run it is not as, a, in a, as efficient as you might have expected because of cost models that aren't transparent, right? So it's important that those two notions match. And so if I look at the way conventional computers are designed, uh, and I'll call that digital clock logics, synchronous logic, which is pretty much almost every electronic, digital electronics you buy today is synchronous, most of it anyway. The, the paradigm sort of gained in popularity and was originally developed when hardware resources were very expensive, right? So it's not, you know, so your, your, the cost of an individual compute element is very high. And so it's incredibly important to use it to the best of your ability. You want to use it all the time to do useful work, right? And that actually very naturally maps to the synchronous paradigm, to the clock paradigm where instead of focusing on, you know, instead of focusing on what my algorithm is doing, you want your hardware resources, which have cost you a huge amount of money, to be used as efficiently as possible. So it's, cri it's critical to do that. So you maximize the reuse, you have used the clock itself to schedule access, and then you make sure every, you know, every step you're doing useful work with every clock tick. And for any, as soon as you organize your algorithms that way, it's very, very natural to use a synchronous clock implementation where at every clock tick, you, do, you make progress, you do useful work, right? Unfortunately, not all algorithms look like this, right? So, of course, we've done a very, very good job of mapping, rewriting, reorganizing algorithms and reorganizing computation to fit this paradigm. But since, uh, you, know, as, you know, as time has evolved and we can do more and more sophisticated things, uh, most of the algorithms today don't look like this. And so as a result, what you end up doing in any modern synchronous chip, which is sort of a very standard practice, is you retrofit all your logic, right? So you say, well, I have all these blocks on my chip. I have a massively parallel chip with lots of little components that are all doing operating in the synchronous paradigm. And what I do is I, is I, I turn things off to save energy when I'm not going to be doing useful work because a lot of times I don't do useful work in a lot of the sections of the chip, right? So that's what you end up doing. So you're sort of retrofitting what sort of a, a design methodology, but for very good reason, there's a huge installed base of this kind of technology. We have a lot of 
uh, support from industry to, to do design this way. But, you know, I'm an academic, I get to dream, I get to do things that aren't necessarily um, uh, immediately commercializable, for example. And so what we've been, the, the, that's why we've been pursuing an alternative strategy, which is actually, if you look very, very carefully, is an older strategy. If you look at sort of the original way computers were described, even, you know, in the von, you know, the classic von Neumann architecture, if you look at the proceedings, they, they talked about asynchronous or self-time logic in there. And what's interesting about the self-timed approach that's sort of in contrast to this uh, time-based, you, know, time, you know, constantly iterating the same kind of operation all the time approach is that by default, you're not doing anything, right? You're waiting for useful information to show up at your inputs to do useful work, right? So the entire compute paradigm essentially looks as follows. You have your chip, just, you know, you have a silicon substrate. We're not, not messing around with the technology here, right? So you have the silicon substrate. You have lots of different components on it, and by default, all of them are waiting for in interesting information to arrive through messages. By the way, the, that should look very familiar to you. Um, our entire internet works this way, right? So, you know, all massively parallel supercomputers look like this. Uh, lots of different, um, especially in the software regime, this is a very, very natural way to think about computing, okay? So you have all these blocks. By default, they're not doing active work. And so by default, they're just idle and hopefully running very, very low power, right? You're not doing useful work, so you just wait. As soon as inputs arrive, you wake up and you do useful computation, and then you produce your outputs, which then in turn trigger computation elsewhere in the system, right? So the entire computation is, proceeds by data moving around, and that's sort of critical because that's sort of what makes it very efficient. You're only waking up and doing useful computation when you have useful work to contribute. Right? That, so that's what makes it all efficient. And as a, as a result, the energy that you require to do computation is really proportional to the activity in the system. It's not proportional to the number of components necessarily. Right? So all the active energy is only used to do useful work. Okay? What's actually remarkable about this methodology, it's been actually around for a very long time, but Almost everybody who designs circuits this way essentially describes their hardware in a programming language, right? So remember I said, this, this, you should see this is actually much closer to an algorithm. The, the, the cost models are going to be very, very similar to what an algorithm does. And as a result, we actually describe the hardware in a parallel programming language where we send messages to each other and then we, we keep doing this. We, we add as much concurrency as we want. We organize the computation by you know, writing things as little parallel programs. And then we turn each program into a circuit and then we build the chip. Pretty, it's a pretty nice methodology, and that's how we design very, very complicated asynchronous circuits can be designed this way. And because of that, implementing circuits with this methodology, when, especially when you don't have a lot of information about, you know, you don't have a lot of history of evolution and improving a design over many, many iterations, if you have an algorithm in mind that you want to implement, implementing it this way usually gives you an efficient, very good efficient implementation because now, You've, your algorithm has been optimized in a certain way, and now the hardware substrates, met, you know, the, the cost metrics match what you would think of from an algorithmic perspective. So it's a very, very good match to those two. And so if you think about everything I just said, this is actually a very, very natural fit to implementing neuromorphic systems. So this is, this is part of why you've heard a lot of different neuromorphic systems use asynchronous logic uh, and self-time logic, especially for communication. There's a very, very natural fit between the two. Uh, when you do comp in a neuromorphic system, the, the, in the sort of the currency of, of uh, computation are spikes, right? You send messages from one neuron to, say, a to a synapse through these digital spikes, right? You've, everybody's been talking about these spikes. They all are digital asynchronous signals, right? And when I get, receive a new spike or maybe even the lack of receipt of a spike conveys information, right, at, at the destination. The neurons and synapses in the neuromorphic system are my sort of compute elements, right? I send information through spikes, and I have compute elements that I use to process those spikes and produce new spikes, right? And because the spikes are what convey information, in fact, it's, very, it's not so easy to predict where the spikes are going to occur a priori, right? Because the spikes themselves drive the computation, right? It's like saying, you know, if I'm adding two numbers, if I knew the answer already, I wouldn't do the addition, right? So, I mean, knowing the answer then lets me know where I have to send what, what information. 
but I can't predict that upfront because that's what I have to do the computation for. Right? So the computation itself determines where the activity is going to be in the system. Right? And that's actually kind of critical. And as a result, what you end up having are compute blocks in these neomorphic architectures that are mostly idle. Right? I mean, so, okay, so just a caveat, so I do circuit design. So for me, idle has a very different meaning from, say, a neuroscientist. Right? We can design circuit blocks that take, you know, hundreds of picoseconds, right? So idle is a very, you know, a, a millisecond is a very, very long time, right, for, for somebody who designs electronics. So that's what I mean when I say compute blocks are mostly idle, right? So as far as a, as a designer of electronic systems is concerned, neomorphic systems hardly ever wake up and do useful things, right? The, as a whole, as an overall block, that, that's not true, but if I look at an individual component, like a single neuron, it's doing nothing most of the time. And that's, so that's actually a mismatch between doing things in a clock-driven manner. And that's why we've been using self-time circuits to design systems of this type. And almost every new, it was actually funny, I was at a talk, I was at a workshop actually organized by Carl Heinz uh, about a year, was it a year ago? And um, it was interesting because I had a list of neuromorphic systems that uh, used asynchronous circuits and there were a whole bunch I didn't know about. And every talk I would listen, I just kept adding to my list, right? And so when I got, to, got out to give my talk, every single previous speaker system was on my slide saying, oh, by the way, you all use asynchronous circuits. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. It's nice to see that that actually the case. So I'm going to now switch gears and talk a little bit about how True North works and how True North uses self-time circuits. So Darwinda has already mentioned that True North is actually very power efficient, right? That's one of sort of the attractive features of this chip, you know. At the end of the day, if you describe everything in a digital computation, I mean, we simulate these, so you can obviously, in principle, run it on a conventional computer. So why bother with a special chip? Well, it's because of the power and uh, the, the energy requirements are significantly lower. The form factor is significantly lower, right? So there are a number of benefits from that. So TrueNote uses uh, 70 milliwatts. Uh, that's, that's a couple of, that's a, at least an order of magnitude less than just the leakage energy in your memory in your laptop, right? So just maintaining the state in your laptop uses a lot more energy than that. So if I'm thinking of neuromorphic computing, I'm going to have things that are triggered by spikes, right? So message spikes convey information through messaging. And so it's very natural to say spikes are self-timed. You don't want a clock to communicate spikes, right? You want the spikes to drive themselves and go where they need to and deliver their information content to their destinations. Neurons, on the other hand, are a little more interesting, right? So, great, they receive spikes and they can update their state, but, you know, almost all, every neural model has some notion of a leak, right? And that's time-driven. That's not spike-driven, right? So that's a local thing. And there are a number of ways you could implement this, but in true north, we actually chose to implement that timing dynamics with an external reference timing signal, which is a clock, actually. Um, and that clock operates at Usually you're used to hearing gigahertz when you say clock, but this clock operates at a kilohertz, right? Because that's the millisecond time scale at which the neurons in true north leak. And so the overall computation for this chip is a hybrid between clock-driven and data-driven, right? So spikes are data-driven, and the leakage of the neuron is clock-driven. And then, of course, you know, whenever you're designing a system, you make trade-offs and you know, make natural engineering trade-offs to improve the overall efficiency, and we sort of merge these two things together. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that to improve the overall system efficiency. So if I look at my chip, the, the True North chip, which we, we worked with for, I don't know how many years now. Dharmendra was telling me, I think we met, what, in 2008 before this project started. And anyway, so we've been working with them very closely ever since. We use, um, so the True North chip we designed, the currency of computation, the currency of information convey, conveyance on chip is spikes. And that's going to be completely, that efficiency is going to be completely destroyed if we have to send, you know, sort of say frame-based information, for example, for images, right? So you, you need to pre-process the input so that you're talking sort of the natural language of the chip. So, right, I mean, the equivalent in a conventional microprocessor would be, you know, I have to program it in assembly language, but of course none of us do that. We, we translate that from a higher level language through, a, through, through software. And so we have to do something similar. We have to adapt, convey, convert the information that we need to process into the natural language of the true north chip, which is spike-based communication. And that's part of why you, you saw Toby's talk, you know, why this is so exciting is because 
we can use these vision sensors whose natural output is spikes, which they've been converting to USB and showing on a display in a frame-based approach so that we can all look at it on a standard laptop and directly process those spikes on True North. So that's the idea. So all information and uh, input and output for the chip has to be spike based. Okay. And there are a number of different ways we can do this. We can use rate-based coding. We can use time to spike coding. There are a number of other things you can do. The chip is agnostic right, to this. So we, we are not dictating the encoding scheme. As long as you can use spikes to represent your information, that's great. So how does the chip actually work? So you've seen this picture before. And, uh, it's sort of a, it's a picture of one of the little cores, one of the 4,096 cores on True North. And the way the chip works is, so I said there's this clock tick that triggers the leakage in, in a neuron, for the leak update. So at the external timing tick, so at that, at that clock ticks, every neuron in the chip sort of goes in and updates its local state. It turns out it's much more efficient to do the spike integration at the same time. So that's what we do from an engineering perspective. That's way more energy efficient. So that's what we do on this chip. So we, we update all the local state, we receive all the incoming spikes, and then a neuron might produce a spike, so in which case it actually sends a spike in a self-time way and it goes through the network and delivers itself to the, the destination. When the spike travels through the network, we're using this, uh, this clock tick, and what that tick allows us to do is deliver a spike at a future point in time, right? because we can, we can count. Right? So you can use this to model things like axonal delays if you wanted. And as a result, what happens is the spike goes to the system and it doesn't actually get delivered to the neuron immediately. It's saved away locally at the destination to be delivered at the appropriate point in time that was designed by, say, the, the algorithm designer. So, so this is sort of the, so if you think about the functional description of what happens on a true north core I just described, that's sort of what this picture it shows you sort of where all the different pieces are physically, right? And, um, you know, so somebody pointed out to me that that router looks really big, but the, you know, this, the, 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 I think the physical dimensions are a couple of hundred micron, right? So it's, it's actually not as big as it might look. Uh, so there's the, the input packet, so that, that block called the scheduler is the way the clock tick is processed, and everything else in the system is basically as, uh, asynchronous. It's self-timed, it's driven by data arrival, right? So this chip's one of these little cores. Uh, the two not, the, this little piece I showed you is just a little core. That core is tiled on a chip. It's 4,096 cores on chip. And then there's an edge network that provides a chip-to-chip -chip connectivity. So you can literally sort of tile the plane with the with two North chips or, you know, however you want to. You know, IBM has some very cool industrial designers. They've come up with really neat uh, topological sort of combinations of these chips, so however you would like to do that. Um, and uh, there's, there's, there's essentially no limit to how far you could tile it. There is a limit on how far an individual packet can travel because there's some budget for how many bits you have to represent various things, but you can always build relays and extend that as much as you want, right? Oops. How do you map algorithms to this chip? So you're going to hear a lot more about this, I think, uh, later this afternoon. But as far as the chip is concerned, the algorithm is simply a graph that contains neurons and synapses, and then properties of those neurons and synapses, right? How, how, in, how much do you weight an input spike? At what rate is the neuron leak? Is there stochasticity or not? There are all of these different parameters that you can specify for every individual neuron in the system. And you know, you've heard the, the, the theme configurable many times, and that's part of the configurability of this chip. You can pretty, you know, the chip is sort of agnostic to the types of computation you do as long as one of the configurations matches what you can do, right? And in fact, we made some very interesting trade-offs in the design of this chip where we simplified the hardware because we could emulate a very complicated neuron with, say, a couple of other neurons, say, three simple neurons. And it turned out that was actually a good idea because you didn't use that very often, for example. Right? So there are a number of engineering trade-offs that get into the design of the chip. But at the end of the day, if I think about how do you specify a graph, well, how do I specify a neuron? Well, there are a bunch of parameters for the neuron, just like you do when you do a software simulation. There are a number of parameters for a neuron. Then there's connectivity. So I need to know which neuron is connected to which other neuron. All of these things can be represented with some, you know, some finite program, if you like, which corresponds to a sort of configuration of everything on this chip. And if I look at this picture, there's that section of it which is labeled SRAM. I'll just show you a slightly bigger one. Right? That's where all that configuration is stored. So it's all, all locally on chip, and it really most of it doesn't move, right? So you need it to keep it there to know what you're doing, but it's not actually moving, shuffling data around at all. It's just sitting there. 
So the algorithm essentially for this chip is a collection of bits. You load those bits onto the chip. So this, for those of you who use FPGAs, this should seem very familiar, right? You write an FPGA description, you compile it into a bit stream, and then you load it up. That's what we do as well. And then the only sort of activity that's now going to happen is that spikes move through the system and update the state. Okay. So I hope I've given you an overview of how the, the basic architecture of TrueNot looks like, and you'll hear a lot more later on. But the essential reason, part of the reason why this chip is so efficient is because we actually use a self-time logic implementation that sort of naturally makes sure that anytime we do an algorithmic optimization, that translates to efficiency in the underlying su implementation substrate. And that, that correspondence really made our life a lot easier. I could, now that I've done this, I could imagine going back and redesigning the chip, but I couldn't imagine doing it any other way uh, as a first step. So in, in true not, our energy is really proportional to spike uh, communication. There's some baseline uh, energy requirement to maintain the state for those memories, but it's quite low, obviously, since the total chip budget is only 70 milliwatts. I think it's about 30 odd milliwatts. And the rest of the chip is self-timed where the energy now is going to scale with how much spike-based activity you have. All the IOs have to be spike-based, and then and you just have the, 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 the challenge is to get an uh, algorithm designer has to come up with a way to describe that computation using, using these sort of neurons and synapses. And the IBM team has done a lot of work in trying to make this e as easy as possible for a user, and you'll hear more about that later. That, I'll stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>